Your Humanities Half Hour is brought to you by the Northern Marianas Humanities Council. Afadades and Tiro, welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. Well, there's a Mariana's treasure nestled in the heart of Garapan Saipan, just waiting to be discovered by our community. And that treasure, located across from um, Sugar King Park, is the Northern Mariana Islands Museum of History and Culture. It's really a treasure trove of information and artifacts covering everything from the beginning of the Marianas um, through current history. And here to share with us about the museum is the executive director, Danny Aquino. Danny, welcome to Your Humanities Half Hour. Thank you for having me. You've obviously been very busy at the museum. Anybody driving by can see all of the work that you're putting in. Um, Start us off with what is the purpose of the museum? The purpose of the museum is to actually um, showcase a lot of our history from the past and to be, it's actually the repository for all of our historical artifacts that dates back to the pre Ladi, Ladi, Japanese era, and the German period. Uh, Share with us a little bit about the organization of the museum. Is it a, a government entity or is it a private entity? It's an independent program from the governor's office. It's a government entity. Okay. entity. And you have a board, correct? Yes. The board is headed by, so far, Chris Conception. Um, we have members um, from NMC. Um, that was uh, Sam Crawford, but I think he's relocating to the States. We have Linda Torres from DCCA, Crystal Cabrera from Public Works, Parker Yobe from DCCA Arts. We have Eloy from Rhoda Historical and um, Mr. Mindiola from the Tinian Historical Preservation. Wow, sounds like a, a wide variety of professions there. And it's wonderful also that Tinian and Rhoda are also represented yes. on the board. That would be very important. Um, As I was mentioning, one of the things that people probably notice the most about the museum is the tremendous um, physical upgrades that seem to have been made in the last um, year or two. Um, Tell us about what changes you've made since you've become the executive director. On my very first day, um, I actually did the uh, walk through the museum and I was actually having second thoughts. (laughs) <laughs> because that was a tremendous amount of work that needed to have been done. Describe uh, to us what the state of the museum was at that point, because I don't think a lot of people are aware of, of how um, yeah. how much need there was. I think to just simplify the whole thing, I would just say to everybody to just close their eyes and just keep them shut, and that's basically what I was walking into. <laughs> Yeah, that, I, I know there was water damage. Yes, there was water on the floor. Structural damage. There was no lighting. And um, this was before any typhoons. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, so I think from what I've, I've gathered was that, you know, a lot of the the issues were over a extended period of time. Um, so when I did my assessment, I noticed, you know, that a lot of the damages were from the trees that were situated along the building, the dog trees. Okay. So I had those removed. Um, we had leaks. Well, I wouldn't call them leaks. I would actually call them like uh, running water from the walls from the rooftop. So we needed to address those issues first, the leaks. We, my understanding was that there was no water for more than nine years. Um, our toilets, for guest toilets, were being used as storage. So it was an overwhelming job. Um, I'm not going to lie to anybody, but we just had to do an assessment and then plan everything. And the main thing was funding. You know, I had to look at the funding issue. And that definitely has been a challenge uh, for the museum. How how did you find the funding to make the repairs? And can you also tell us a little bit about the various funding sources that yes. the museum utilizes? 
When I came on board, I was actually blessed, you know, to have the support from the governor, um, governor, lieutenant governor, the legislators, and um, I looked at the um, the positions, the allocations for positions. So I saw that when I came on board, it was already towards the end of the fiscal year. So we reprogrammed the um, the remaining positions that weren't filled. So that freed up a little money. And then MVA came on board, of course, to help the museum with uh, 50000 The legislature, with through the efforts of the uh, speaker, Rob Timapon, and uh, chairman for Ways and Means, and, of course, our SNAL chairman, John Paul, they all um, recognized that the museum was in trouble and needed uh, some funding. So they gave me a supplemental funding, I think, of about 100000 so that's what we use. And um, what are the improvements, the major improvements that you've made? Okay, within the first 20 days, um, we addressed uh, the issue on the roof. We had um, the entire roof uh, grinded, the cracks, and then um, we had some elastomeric primer done. And I asked the uh, contractor at that time to put the uh, L brackets along some of the seams on the roof so that the walls would, uh, on the rooftop, would just mend as one uh, because we had issues as far as the water going in from the uh, corners, you mm. know. So that was done. We had some elastomeric done. And these aren't just like three or four. We had at least like maybe more than seven coats of elastomeric sealant on the roof. Wow. Yeah. So to this day, there's no leaks. And then after that, we addressed the issue of the water because, you know, that's a public uh, health issue. So we ran new water lines, and those were all exposed around the building. Um, that was done, and then we started doing the inside renovation. And uh, most recently, I understand you've also converted uh, the building next to the actual museum. And yes. I think we should preface this description um, with an explanation that the museum is actually a historically significant building. Yes. Um, what is the history of the museum building? The museum is actually the bu the museum is actually a temporary. It was supposed to be a temporary museum um, to hold the um, the artifacts. It's 92 years old. It's actually the old Japanese hospital. Um, and then the um, other building that we recently completed that we are trying to transform into our coffee shop is the old Japanese laboratory building. You know, I have to say, you seem to have been the perfect person for this job because not only are you a uh, veteran with all of the military thinking of getting things done in the mission, yeah. but you also have a background in engineering. And who better could have come in to save our museum <laughs> <laughs> in its you. greatest hour of need? Yes. And, of course, uh, acknowledgement to all of those um, people and organizations um, and government offices you mentioned that helped out. It just goes to show what can be accomplished yes. uh, when we unite in, in a mission. Correct. Yes. Um, wonderful to have you there uh, leading that. Um, so now that your coffee shop is open and the museum yes. is um, restored, um, are you open to the public now? The museum is open from Monday to Friday, um, 9 to 4. And then on Saturdays, because there has been a lot of requests, we open that from 10 to 4. Okay, so 9 to 4, Monday through Friday. Correct. And Saturdays from 10 to 4. Yes. Uh, is there any fee for people who would like to visit? You know, we're asking the um, for like adults, we're asking for like a $3 donation. And then for children, it's like a dollar. Okay, yeah. very reasonable. You also do a number of school trips, uh, school field trips during yes. the year. This coming Friday, I think we have the um, we have um, 120 packs, um, and throughout the year we've we've entertained like um, students from Hopwood, um, Southern. So we've got our numbers up there. Um, some schools, you know, it's very sad that they have to pay for busing to come to the museum. So you know. We don't want to really burden the schools, the school children or the parents. So sometimes we, um, when they're having a hard time, we just waive the uh, the fee to come in. The entrance fee. Correct, because they have to pay for their busing. I think another thing that's very generous of you, um, another thing to point out is you don't have a v uh, enormous staff um, running this place. 
We actually have um, three staff, um, and I think that was uh, consider considerably less from previous years or when the museum first started. And I owe a debt of gratitude to them. That's Mr. James Macaronis. He's our building and facilities manager. He's been there forever, practically. Correct, yes. yes. He's probably part of the uh, <laughs> exhibits or the, <laughs> the artifacts. But you know, he's still taking and I'm glad I still have him there um, to help me out. We have uh, Mr. Winnie Hadwell. Uh, and then we have um, J.D. J.D. Um, Regis. Okay. Um, I know one of the things that um, is required for museums in order to get a lot of grants is having a curator. Correct. Is that something that's in your budget? The, um, this has been the ongoing issue as far as the um, positions are concerned, the funding, the stability of funding, the continuity of funding. So the issue is, yes, we needed to have a curator um, in order to avail to grants. And then we also had to have a steady source of support, financial support, from the government. Um, so basically, you know, um, that's, these are the issues that we're trying to tackle with. In order to address the curator, we, we've brought on board um, Scott Russell, but he's just like an independent contractor because, as you know, the we're going through an austerity and um, positions were slashed. So it's best to just keep them at an independent director's level and that would be acceptable under like a grant application or something like yes, that yes okay. but th but you know it's going to be very difficult for the museum to qualify for the grant so um one of the things that i forgot to mention was that so we completed our our concrete slabs and what we intend to do was to have like a cultural um show uh similar to like what we have at the street market but we want to emphasize like our local culture Chamorro, carolinian Yes. stuff like that so I we've like completed it. i think 14 uh, slabs we want to add more and then we're going to build our our huts oh that. okay yeah and with are you thinking that this would be something open daily or several days a week we, morning or evening we were already in talks with uh, mr parker yobe mm -hmm. at the arts and then the indigenous affairs and carolinian affairs so we want to try like at least once a week oh yeah. okay we're going to designate once a week and see how that goes and then eventually we're trying to secure additional funding to fence up the perimeter. That way when we're full, we're already completed with all of everything that we've wanted to do. Um, we're going to be just charging right at the gate. Oh, okay. Well, that'll be a, a probably a welcome addition to nighttime activities. Because I know a lot of visitors are looking for more and different types of things yes. to do in the evening. They can go to the beach during the day. But Correct. this is something they could enjoy in the evening. And um, that's one of the good things is that the MVA has been very supportive. Um, they've been helping us out financially, and then they've also been giving us, um, like, guides, like, um, uh, what do you call it, these travel agents to come by to, to inspect the museum. And then they're also including us in their, in their um, travel packages, like promotions, I'm sorry. Yes, great. Well, when we come back, I want to ask you to take us um, on a virtual tour not a, a tour in our minds through the museum just right. to show people um, what they can look forward to when they visit all right sure all right we'll be back with that after this break did you know that you can donate up to five thousand dollars to the humanities council through the cnmi education tax credit program donations from individuals and corporations qualify and can be used to offset your local wage and salary tax bgrt and earnings tax Call our office at 235-4785 to see how you can support humanities programs in our community and obtain a tax credit for your donation. Sizu Usma'asi, Olomai, and thank you. Welcome back to Your Humanities Half Hour. Our guest today is the Executive Director of the Northern Mariana Islands Museum of History and Culture, Danny Aquino. Danny, I have to say, the museum, I think, is the perfect place um, starting point for any visitor to the Marianas because it really you can really get a, a grasp of our entire history in a short amount of time, especially for first time visitors. They're they're they kind of I think are um, amazed that we have like uh, so many different influences. We have Spanish, we have Japanese, we have this indigenous culture, and they can't uh, maybe can't understand how it all came to be. But when you get to the museum. 
you understand how it ha- how it happened. That's correct. <laughs> um, take us on a walk through through the museum. What can people um, expect? Actually, what you can expect when you um, first park is that you're going to notice that the grounds are immaculate. True. Then as you start to proceed into the uh, museum, you're going to notice that the inside um, of the museum is very immaculate and clean. Uh, to start it off, you're going to see that there's a large format um, vinyl prints of the German era. And um, as you walk through the um, right side of the museum, the new wing of the museum, you're going to notice that there's a Japanese section with also like large format prints of the uh, Matsue period, the sugarcane era. And then uh, as you swing around, you're going to go through the um, Chamorro, pre Ladi and Ladi periods. And we're going to go through the Marianas, the um, government as it first established after the war. And then through the um, Spanish era, the conception, of course. That's one of our prized possessions. And then the last one is the Fresenes. Uh, Fresene, uh prints that Correct. were made of Micronesian people. Yes. Um, I forget when that was, 18, 1800s maybe? Nine? <laughs> Prior to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, what are some of your favorite artifacts, or do you feel are the mo- more interesting artifacts to you that the museum houses? Of course, I tend to agree with everybody. The, of course, the Spanish galleon, that's one of the most interesting ones. The um, pre laddie the pre laddie period, how... Yeah, what do we have from the pre laddie period? We have the um, bone spears. Um, mm. There's the sling stones, the uh, fish hooks, and all those stuff. The pottery, those are pretty remarkable. Yes. And then one of the uh, favorites also is the man of Taga head. Very interesting. In f- it's a reconstruction uh, base, a forensic reconstruction, I, I, if I'm uh, correct. Correct. Of the bones taken from a Chamorro, ancient Chamorro gravesite, and they reconstructed what they believed the person looked like. Yes. Uh, I have to ask you, does that reconstruction remind you of anybody you know personally today? Because it di- I don't want to say who it was, but when I saw it, I was like, <laughs> that looks like so-and-so. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just ask, does it remind you of anybody you know today? Yes, but I don't want to say it. <laughs> we don't want to say who it is, so we're inviting everybody to come to the museum and make your own judgment. Um, very interesting, very interesting part. Can you tell us a little bit more about the uh, uh, the uh, galleon um, artifacts that you have there, a little bit of history about it? The, um, from what my understanding is that on 1638, the galleon um, was captained by a Filipino captain. Oh, yeah, okay. From the governor of the Philippines. And the crew weren't happy wasn't happy about that. They weren't too thrilled that there was a Filipino captain on, uh, guiding the ship. So there was like a mutiny on board as they proceeded to Saipan. They ran into a storm in Saipan and they ran aground. So the ship went down. Some of the survivors that did make it ashore were eventually killed by the locals. Yeah, so. And then I want to also put to rest that, you know, this rumor floating around. Um, by certain conspiracy theorists that the gold and everything that was there in the museum is there um, when I got there and it's still there. Um, That kind of makes sense. And for those of us that were lucky enough uh, to see it, um, if it is, you know, uh, secured better than it was at that time, that's probably a good thing, I would say. Yes. Yeah. Um, very interesting story of, nu- I believe it was the Nuestra Señora de la Concepción, if I'm... Correct, yes. Okay, great. My, my And my history class is coming back <laughs> to me. But, you know, I, I hadn't realized that uh, part of the reason it capsized was because there was a mutiny. I mean, it makes sense, right? Like a captain yes. would know what they were doing. Spanish ship, Filipino captain. Yeah, yeah, but if there was a problem on board, yeah. that would exp- explain uh, partially why things went wrong. Yes. And uh, it, did this capsize uh, like someplace near Coral Ocean Golf Resort? Within that, that area. Yeah. Agigan, I think. Yeah. 
Very interesting. So these are some of the permanent exhibits um, there, but occasionally I understand you sometimes have special exhibits as well? Um, right now, we haven't really like done any. Um, we have the special exhibits as far as like um, when the humanities does it, like we've, we've had recently with this, um, the never seen before um, World War II photos. Yes. Yeah, so those are sam- examples of it. Um, we also have the um, Guam Museum, just to let your audience know. They're going to be coming down um, shortly, and they're going to do a refresher of the museum, and they're going to also upgrade. So you're going to see some new changes. Uh, we're going to see the uh, Spanish era um, revamped um, and expanded to also include um, stuff from the uh, the bishop. Bishop Museum. No, from the bishop. Oh, the bishop himself. Yes, Bishop Jimenez. Oh, Jimenez. Yeah, but we're going to oh. also include stuff from uh, Bishop Camacho. Oh, wow. That's that's going to be interesting, especially yes. for those of us that have been there before. Correct. This is going to be a great reason to go back again. Yes. How can we keep the museum moving in the direction that you've started? Is there going to be a concern for funding, or um, what can the community do to support the museum best? Right now, like as far as the community is concerned, you know, you can. we're trying to build local interest in the museum. Um, we find that that's always been the problem since the museum first opened, you know, um, our, the local support, um, is coming around now that, um, we're having these, uh, rotating exhibits. So we're hoping that the locals can continue to come in, especially the millennials, bring your children in. It's a, it's a fun place for family, um, to get together, to learn, to spend a weekend. The other thing is also to talk to your congressmen because one of the biggest challenges that we have is that we have the um, the um, Commonwealth Museum Act. It's the law that has created the museum. Um, in my opinion, it's obsolete. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. The museum needs to be run more independently. Um, we need to have better better control over our own funding in order for the museum to be sustainable and to survive. Um, what I mean by B- uh, more control. We need to have our own control of our own finances and accounting, which is something that we're going to look at. Um, we've discussed this with the board. And then we also need to have more teeth in the uh, the act itself. Okay. You know, so these are, it's, it's very challenging when you have a very minimal staff. So that's one of the challenges. So I'm trying to find creative ways to address a lot of these situations. I would have to agree with you, Danny, that um, it's it's a great place for family and children also because um, there's a lot of things that we can put our attention on nowadays. But if we don't um, remember where where we came from and yeah. how we got here, then it, we kind of lose part of our identity. Correct. And um, like I said, I personally found the artifacts very uh, interesting. Yes. And it's not uh, so big that it's going to like wear you down going through the museum. Um, I really feel that it is the investment of the $3 per adult and $1 per child. That's a donation. <laughs> Correct. Respectfully requested. It it really is worth it. And so it would be great, um, especially in the summertime. Perfect time to come out yes. to the museum. The other thing I also want to mention is that, you know, back in 1998, when, the, um, you know, when there was talks about um, an interest in opening up a museum, was that the government had a grant. And in this grant, they already established that there was a need to have at least uh, an adequate amount of money. And it started off with 500000 to effectively run the museum. And then after that, it, continu- it continuously grows. It gets bigger, mm-hmm. like at least 5 10%. So we have, um, we're working on something right now. It's the open container, non-alcoholic open container tax. And we've been uh, given like um, assurances from the House. And now we're hoping for the Senate to bless this. It would give the museum upwards of about 150 to 250,000 on top of our appropriations. This is something we greatly need in order to have the museum like continue to to reach out to the local to have for the locals to have interest in the museum. Mm-hmm. So our exhibits can rotate at least twice a year. And in regards to having rotating exhibits, what people will see when they go now is only a small portion of a- what that museum actually holds. Yes. 
they've actually been seeing stuff that's been there, you know, the, the, the way it's been for the past 10 years. So that's why, you know, you can't really blame them, you know, if they're not really interested because it's been the same thing for 10 years. So now we're kind of lucky that the humanities join in partnership with us and brought those new, those new stuff. So it, it created a lot of interest. So if you want to see what's there now before it changes, you can go now and then you can go maybe next year or the year after and then see what the new exhibits are. I love it. And, and just keep going. Um, definitely want to get as many people through those doors as we can. And it's wonderful now that you have regular hours so that yes. it can be promoted to our visitors as well. Um, I want to thank you for not only your time today, but for also your uh, leadership in helping get our getting our museum back on its feet. Um, any final thoughts before we go? I just want to thank you for inviting me here. Um, I want to invite the public, you know, um, to come down to the museum. I'm very flexible. You know, if the if your children want to come in and you don't really have that the uh, entrance, sometimes I just allow families to go in, especially families that have large large kids, you know, family size. We let them go in. Um, I want to continue to appeal to the congressmen and senators to please support the museum. You know, um, we've invested so much money in the the galleon, the conception, the treasures, in the fresenes. So without the funding, some of these things are going to be lost forever. You know, they're, they can't be replaced. I brought it back. And I want to hope that whoever is the next uh, executive director is able to have their job a lot easier. And I also want to thank the governor, Lieutenant Governor, for the continued support. Before we go, give us your contact information, either online or phone contacts, and your hours once again. Okay, the museum is open from Monday through Saturday. On Monday to Fridays, it's open from 9 to 4. Saturdays is 10 to 4. Our contact number is 664-2160. If anyone has any questions or would like to schedule a time to come in. Okay. Our guest today has been Danny Aquino, the Executive Director of the NMI Museum of History and Culture, located in Garapan, Saipan. Danny, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been Your Humanities Half Hour. I'm Catherine Perry. This program was supported by a We the People grant awarded to the Northern Marianas Humanities Council from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily represent those of the National Endowment for the Humanities or the Northern Marianas Humanities Council.